How you doing? <laughs> so I got to follow my son, who did a great job last week, didn't he? Rotten kid. <laughs> We've been in this series called Leverage, and this is our uh, final message in this series. And we talked about our first message was about leveraging relationships and, and how do we look at relationships. And uh, do we look at them for the kingdom or do we look at them selfishly for us? And, and, and what's important in those relationships? Are we leveraging those relationships for advancing the kingdom of God, both maybe in that person's life or in general to the world? So loving people creates leverage for the kingdom of God. And that's why Life Coast Church is all about loving people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our vision because loving people is leverage for the kingdom of God. We talked about leveraging our time. Pastor Brian was up here. How many of you here for Pastor Brian's message? <laughs> leveraging time. That was amazing. What do our schedules look like? What do we put in our schedules first? Is our schedule kingdom heavy or is it self-heavy? Is What's our schedule look like? Are we scheduling kingdom things or are we scheduling selfish things? What does that look like? And he gave the ultimate leveraging time when he, when he kneeled down here and washed the feet of someone who gives so much of their time for the kingdom of God. And Dee was up here and got a nice foot wash and he looked very happy to uh, receive that. And uh, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He was leveraging his time as a servant because Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's what he's asking us to do, to be servants, to leverage our time. And in that, Alex gave a message last week, as I said, about leveraging our talent for the kingdom of God. What do you do good? What is it that you do so well that when people think of that thing, they think of you? And that do you take that talent and offer it for the kingdom of God? Because really, the only reason we have talent at all is because God's given it to us. So our talent doesn't even belong to us. Our time doesn't belong to us. Our relationships don't belong to us. They all belong to God because that's where they came from. That's where they originated. And Alex just, just brought it. One of my favorite lines of the whole day is that you know, serving is a privilege. Serving is a privilege. Do we look at serving in the kingdom of God as a privilege? And the other one is, if serving is beneath you, then leading is beyond you. Come on. That was good stuff, man. You've got to get that picture because Christ followers don't just serve. We are servants. And we got to realize that, that that's who we are in Christ. We become servants of the Most High God. And that is a privilege. So now... As we come to this final message, we've talked about leveraging our relationships. We've talked about leveraging our time. We've talked about leveraging our talents. And now we're going to talk about what everybody loves to hear, leveraging our resources, leveraging our treasure. And what does that look like? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. And all of these things that we've talked about, our relationships, our talent, our time, and now our very resources, the very things that we have, the very uh, money that we use to buy them, that we are just stewards of that, all of those things, that the only reason we have anything that we have is because of who you are. We ask, Lord, that, that you would just help me to get out of the way here and let your word be proclaimed that your spirit move in this place, that hearts would be touched and understand that the principles of your word are not rules to keep us down, but opportunities to live, lift us up. We ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So this is always a topic that people either love or hate, right? You either love talking about financial principles in the Bible or you hate it. And the ones who love it are the ones who've actually tested it, put God to the test in their financial principles, and have come to realize that what God has in his word for us about handling all of our finances is an amazing blessing and it's an amazing road to financial peace. How many of you would you like some financial peace in your life? Yeah, I know, I, I know, I'm there, I get it. Let me ask you a question. A lot of people think that the only reason churches talk about money is because they just want my money. They just want my money. How many of you ever heard that or thought that or said that? Yeah. Well, do you believe that God is the creator of all things? Do you believe that every single thing that's been created from time beginning until this day now was created by God? That girl's got it. <laughs> then don't you think that if God really wanted your money, he would just take it? Wouldn't he? Because it's all his anyways. See, God wants to bring you peace. Peace in the area of money. Because quite frankly, as I said, we're just stewards of all the money that all belongs to him anyways. And so we're going to talk about that. Listen to what God's word says about doing things his way as opposed to our way. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, it disappeared, and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So how many ways is God asking us to submit to him? All, all. Some of you were tentative there. How many ways? All. Now all say all. All. <laughs> all our ways. Why do you think God wants us to submit all of our ways to him because he wants to make our path straight. He wants to open the doors. He wants the path to be clear. He wants us to have peace in knowing where we're going in every arena of our life. Sometimes it makes people uneasy when pastors talk about money. And sometimes it makes pastors uneasy when he talks about money. Because, you know, as I went through this message this week and the weeks prior, because I knew it was coming, I have to admit, this isn't my favorite topic. i got to tell you, it's just not. And as I went through Scripture, and we went away to ARC two weeks ago, the ARC conference. Let me tell you something. I was lifted up and filled up and fed, and I am still pumped because of that. And I had two cups of coffee this morning. So you get the ark infusing your heart and the caffeine infusing your system, and who knows what's going to happen today. So I'm just fired up. There's three biblical principles at work here, and I want to talk about them when we talk about money, because some churches just talk about the money you're supposed to give to them. I think that's a little selfish, because God says he wants to talk about all the money that you get that he gives you, that he blesses you with. He wants you to understand how to handle all of that money, not just what needs to go back to the storehouse. So the three principles we're going to talk about this morning, and I may go a little fast because I want to get the information in there, but what I want to tell you is if you have, if you're hurting in this area, you're struggling in this area, that the next two Wednesdays, at Word on Wednesday, we're going to have a guest speaker in, Jim Landaker, whose profession it is to help people handle money. And he's going to teach some more principles on this, much deeper, answer a lot of questions. So come out on Wednesday night at 6, and you can get a lot of questions answered. So if I skip over something, or if I'm going a little fast because of the caffeine and the arc, then you can come out Wednesday night, and Jim is going to be there. I'll be there with you too, and we can walk through this together. But the three principles that we're going to talk about, the first principle is first fruits. 
The first fruits principle, we have to understand that if we're going to understand anything about handling money in a biblical way. The second one is giving and saving. Giving and saving, that's the second principle. And the third one is reaping and sowing. All right, so we're just going to get rolling right into it. First fruits principle. This is both a simple and a difficult principle to understand. The first fruits principle is a faith principle. It's about our faith. And here it is. What we understand about the first fruit principle, the percentage of our faith is revealed through how we invest in the first fruits principle. I believe that our percentage of faith is directly proportionate to our percentage of how we give in first fruits. And I've discovered that in my own life over the years, that I would have a percentage of faith in the first fruits principle. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go all the way in. I wouldn't go all in because my faith at times was lacking. That God would handle the rest. But the first fruits principle says that you give the first. The first of the money. The first of the grain. The first of what you make. The first of the resources. You give the first part to God. Because you're in faith you're knowing he will take care of you in the rest. This started before Even the law started. Cain and Abel in the garden gave the first of their crops, the first of what they what they made. And that's why that's why one one offering was accepted. Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not. Because Cain's offering says, in the course of time, Cain gave his offering. So he didn't give a first fruits offering. He waited to see how much he had, and then he gave some to God. So that first fruits offering is very important. And the law incorporated it in. As Moses got the law and he wrote the the books of the law, this first fruits principle was put into the law. So it predates the law. So it's a principle that God has had right from the beginning. And then he made it a law to help them understand it. And now we're free from the law, so we now still hold it as a principle. Okay, does everybody understand that? Is that understandable? We got that. Okay, good stuff. So the second one is giving and saving. We want to understand the giving and saving. These biblical concepts help us better understand the first fruits and kind of lay out what that first fruits will be. See, the biblical concept will start with giving. There's actually within the giving, there's actually three different kinds of giving in the Bible. See, we hear tithes and offerings and gifts, and we lump them all together as the same thing. But the Bible clearly defines them as different things. It's very clear. And, 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 and at first, I got to tell you, I was with most people. I thought these were all generic terms for the same exact thing. But the tithe simply means this. It means a tenth. It means a tenth. One tenth. So the tithe is one-tenth of whatever you make. That's what goes back to God. That's the first fruits is the tithe. Now, I know some of you are saying, you're sitting here, you're talking, thinking to yourself, but the tithe is part of the law. The tithe is, is, is part of the law, and we don't live under the law anymore, so we don't need the tithe. But remember, remember the first fruits principle predates the law. Remember that? It started with Cain and Abel. Well, here in Hebrews 7, 1, through, 1 and 2, it says this. This... Melchizedek was the king of Salem and the priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth or a tithe of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. So here's the thing. Abraham predates the law by more than 400 years. So Abraham already understood the tithe principle before the law was ever written. So just like the first fruits was a principle that predates the law, the tithe is a principle that predates the law as well. It then gets incorporated into the law. So everybody is required to do it in Israel. But then We're free from the law, once again, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We're not bound by the law, but the principle of the tithe carries on, predating the law, through the law, and beyond the law. Does that make sense to everybody? You all with me? So, the tithe, or the tenth, is what we give 
to the Lord. This is what we give towards God. Malachi 3.10 says this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food for my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So that's the tithe. God wants the tithe, the tenth, to be brought into his storehouse. The cultural equivalent to the storehouse of the Old Testament would be what? You could say it out loud. The church. The church. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's a good word. You, you, you bring it to the church. So the next is the offering. Isn't that the same as the tithe? This is giving from your heart. This is the over and above what the tithe is. This is beyond the tithe. This is when you feel God moving you to give extra, giving more. Because he's blessed you more, you now have more to give. This is from your heart. This is when the Holy Spirit tells you, yes, I'm moving there, give more. This is what that is. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we say, yes, that's the New Testament giving. That's all of giving for the New Testament. Well, let me tell you something. This is an offering verse, not a tithe verse. And I'll prove it this way. Exodus 25, 2 says this. Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering You are to receive the offering from me, everyone whose heart prompts them to give. It's the same language. It's the same language. It's the offering. It's the over and above the tithe. When God wants you to give to something where he's moving, you see he's moving. You want to be a part of it because you're a servant of God and you want the kingdom to advance and you want to leverage the blessing that he's given you. You say, I want to give more to that because I see God moving and I want to be a part of it. It's for you. It's not for God. He wants you to be part of the movement. He wants you to get in the game. He wants you to leverage what you have for the kingdom so you can watch him move. And we're going to talk about God moving in a minute. And I, I just want to keep going because I don't want to leave get, talking about here all afternoon. There's a lot of information here, and that's why we're going to do it on Wednesday with Jim. So if you don't get something or you have a question about something, I want you to show up there Wednesday, next two Wednesdays. Come on out. The very same concept for both the Old Testament and the New Testament is that offering, that heart offering. And finally, we come to the gift. The gift. So we have tithes, offerings, and gifts. And you say, my goodness, wouldn't that be the same thing? It's not. It's something totally different. And, and, and the gift is the, the charitable giving, what you might give to the food pantry, to the March of Dimes, to something other than the tithe and the offering. It's, what you, it's, when you, it's a benevolence type of thing. That's how it's described in Scripture. It's to help the poor. It's to help the needy. It's a gift. And that, again, is from the heart. That is an optional giving. That's when God is blessing you, You have more to give, and then you give a gift. Leviticus 23, 38 says, These offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbath, that's the tithe, and in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed and will be freely offering, you give to the Lord. And all the free will offerings you give to the Lord. So the gift is over and above the offering. It's over and above the tithe. And it's from your heart. It's completely optional. Whatever God is moving you to give, that's what you give. So it's very clear that God himself is a giving God. Do we believe that God is a giving God? I mean, he even says it. The big gospel verse, for God so loved the world that he he gave. He gave. Love gives. That's all there is to it. Love gives. God wants to give in these three areas. Now look, Deuteronomy 12, 11 says, Then to the place the Lord your God will choose a dwelling for his name. And there you will bring everything I have commanded you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. So God's house, the dwelling place with his name. What's that? 
It's a church. It's the dwelling place with his name that we bring our tithes there. We bring our offerings there. We bring our gifts there. And I put up a simple chart to help us understand it using very simple numbers. So we got if $100, start with $100, then the tithe would be $10 out of that. That's one-tenth for those who struggle with fractions. Five-fourths of people struggle with fractions. <laughs> Just gave you a little break there. Then there's an offering. We'll say it's 5%. Five, 5% five It's optional. And then there's a gift that maybe you give $5. That's optional. And then you have $80 for yourself. Now, isn't that generous? If all the money belongs to God anyways, and he says, just give me a tenth, and then out of your heart, maybe give some for other things, and then you keep the rest. God's generous. He wants you to to have a good and prosperous life, but he wants you to understand what the deal is. He wants you to understand that what he says in his word is not to take from you It is for you to be blessed. Now, let's add some savings to that, because this was the giving and savings section, right? So sure, God tells us to give in faith, give to him where he's at work, give to those in need as a gift, as an offering, as a tithe. So the formula for for saving, when you put away money, when you save money, who are you giving money to? Yourself. You're right, yourself. So what's the formula for that? Is that anywhere in the Bible? Where's the formula for saving? Do we know what God says about saving? Genesis 41, 34 through 36 says this. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners. My voice is going. If anybody can get me some water, that would be awesome. Over the land to take a fifth. There's those fractions again. Take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country so to be used during seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so the country may not be ruined by the famine. So what this is trying to tell us, in times of plenty, in times of abundance, when you're making a good living, you should be saving 20%. One-fifth equals 20%. So if you are giving a tithe of 10% and God wants you to save for yourself 20%, who is God being more generous to? Me. Me. That's right, he is. And so if we have that same formula, if we have $100 and we tithe uh, 10 and we offer five as an offering and we give five as a gift, then he says during times of plenty, we should take $20 and put it away for when times are hard, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that if we're not in times of plenty, we don't still put something away. But 20% seems to be what God says, thank you very much, is the cap. Save 20%. So when hard times come, now you can tap into that when you need it. Okay, now you can save that any way you want. You can save some for a rainy day. You can save some for your vacation fund. You can save some for your future. You can save some for your children. But save something. Save something. So the times of abundance, we save a fifth. Does God want your money? You think he wants your money? Well, I'm going to disagree with you. Darn tootin' he wants your money. Absolutely he does. You know why he wants it? Because people's hearts are connected to their money. And he doesn't really want your money. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him so much that your money means nothing to you because you are pursuing the kingdom of God. And that, that's why he wants your money because it's getting in the way of him touching your heart. That's why he wants your money. He wants it, not because he needs it. It's already his. But he says, man... If it's in the way of me loving you and pressing into you and blessing you, then by golly, I'm going to take it all. And you know what? I know that because in my life he did that. I had money saved up when we moved down here. And I didn't do this. And by golly, that money vanished. And I said, God, man, you took my money. But we go back to the principles. We go back 
to the principles that bring blessing and prosperity. Not because God wants everyone to be rich. We're not that church. I just want to tell you right now. We're not that church. But God does want you to be blessed, whatever that means, for him and you. He wants to bless you. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I know what you're thinking. I'm not rich. I'm not a rich person. Well, let me tell you something. I looked this up. I'd heard it before, and I didn't know what the exact number was. So I looked this up. The global median income, average annual income, is $1,225 a year. $1,200. $1,200. Two zeros. Hundred, twelve hundred dollars. That's twenty four dollars a week. Twenty four dollars a week. I know some of us spend more than that on coffee. That's the average annual income. Are we rich? We are rich. We are the richest nation on this planet. We are rich. I don't think. I know some of you are thinking, I, 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 but I can't do that, Pastor Jeff. I'm not set up that way. I'm not set up for, for, to give 10% of my money and, and put 20% away. Then I won't be able to pay all my bills. Well, well, you know what? God knows that. He knows that if you didn't start out this way, that you're going to have to chart a course to get there. Okay? Because he doesn't want to pull the rug out from under you and let you fall on your face. Although he's done that sometimes too. But, but what he's saying is start with a plan. Even if you start saving 1%, giving 1% with a plan that when he starts to bless you, that you increase it to 2, to 5, to 6, to 10, and then your savings can increase all the more because let me tell you something, God, this is one of the only principles in the Bible where God says, you don't believe me? Test me. Test me. You try it and see what happens. Right here, Malachi 3.10, we already had this verse, but it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. He says, test me. He says, test me. You're not going to get it past me. I'm going to see your plan to do things my way. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. How many ways? So he said, all your ways except money. No, no. Let's get baptized and hold our wallet up out of the water. That's, uh, that, that's what some people do. And so they don't want to give all. They want to give some. And I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this for you because the last principle we want to talk about is the reaping and the sowing principle. And some of us may not know these words. They're kind of old words, but you might know it better as planting and harvesting. Planting and harvesting. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So generously. The first two principles were first fruits, giving and saving. And when those things are at work, this is the reaping and sowing principle. So how we choose to engage in God's ways will directly determine how God will engage in our life. Uh-oh. See, God tells us about morality in here. He tells us about relationships in here. He tells us 
about raising children in here. He tells us about marriage in here. And he tells us about finances in here. Why do we only pick and choose the things that we want out of here to apply to our lives? Because it's all in here. He wants to give us the truth through his word. And his financial ways are the best. The reaping and sowing, here's a truth I read this week. You will always reap what you sow. You will always reap more than you sow. And you will always reap later than you sow. Because it doesn't happen right away. You see, God's an amazing father. And he wants to bless his children. He really does. But he also wants us to engage in how he's taught us. Okay? We had a great example of that this week in the Barksdale home. Okay? Some of you saw Tyler. Tyler got a, a vehicle this week. His first vehicle. Okay? Give him a hand. All right. Tyler's been wanting a vehicle for a while. And we've been telling Tyler that he needs to save some money. If you want a car, you need to save. This is a, this is a principle. And so Tyler finally figured it out. He started to save money. And he saved enough money for his down payment. And then mom and dad said, we want to bless you in your efforts. And so whatever car you buy, we'll pay the tax and the fees for you so you don't have to pay that additional amount. Because a good father blesses his children when they follow his principles. So Tyler got his car and he didn't have to pay the taxes. So that's a good deal for him. God wants to bless us the same way, right? God gives us these examples in life because he wants us to see how he functions. He wants to show us how he functions. God wants to bless us because he wants to be deeper in a relationship with us. This is how he works. Deuteronomy 28, 12. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in the season and to bless the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from none. To bless the work of your hand. God wants to bless the work of your hand. He wants to bless the work of the hand of Life Coast. We were at the Ark, and one of, the, one of my favorite speakers of the, whole, of the whole conference was David Summerall. And, and here's what he, he said this. I'm going to share it with you. I'm, I'm going to try to read it so I don't get it wrong. God only asks us to be obedient in the natural what we can humanly do. He only asks us to be obedient in the natural. And then he will bring the supernatural. Do you get that? When we do what he asks us to do in his word, everything that is humanly possible for us to do, he's not asking us to perform any miracles. He's not asking us to do anything crazy. He's not asking us to even say we're going to do anything crazy. He says, you just do things the way I've instructed you to do it, and then I am going to show up in a supernatural way that's going to blow your socks off. And it's only going to be because of me, not because of anything that you did. And I know that you understand that. I know that you do because I've seen it at work here. I saw it at work two weeks before Easter. I saw it right here. Maybe, maybe nobody else saw it, but I saw it. That God showed up here beyond what we could possibly imagine. Do you guys remember that board, that white board we put up here? We said we wanted to invite people to come to Life Coast Church. We wanted to be praying for opportunities to invite people to church. Does everybody remember that board? It's a picture of it with people writing names on that board. Well, I counted the names on that board because I was praying for all of them. I was praying for all of you to have opportunity to invite people for Easter Sunday. And there was about 170 names on that board. And we have a general number of people, an average number of people. I asked Ryan for that number this week. What's our average been over the past since January? What's our average attendance been at Life Coast Church? He gave me that number. Do you know how many people above our average that we had on Easter Sunday? 170. 
God just asks us to do what we can do in the natural, and he is going to show up in a supernatural way. That there's no other thing we could account it to except the power of God and the obedience of his people. I believe that God wants to do amazing things at Life Coast Church. And guess what? If, if God's people would just understand this principle, every single person that's part of any church anywhere, church ministries would be fully funded. Missionaries would never struggle to raise money to go on the mission field. And you know what? There would be so much. People have done the statistics on this. There would be so much extra that government programs could be canceled because God's people would be taking care of the poor. There would be so much, so many resources to help those who are hurting. If God's people would embrace the principles, just do what is natural. Do what we can do in the natural. And we can leverage those things for the kingdom of God. I know God has a place for us. I've been saying this before and I'm going to keep saying it. Because I know that God wants us to partner in this. To get his house in Palm Coast. Where Life Coast Church can love people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That there's going to be a family center that is going to touch the hurting. That is going to bring people in to the storehouse of God. Because they need to hear about Jesus Christ. And he wants this fellowship to be a part of it. And we need to step into what we do in this area. If we are going to be a part of it. And we need to pray and say, God... How do I need to make my adjustments? Who can I connect with to help me make those adjustments? Because we have counselors here that can help you. Come out Wednesday night, and you can get some deeper instruction on how to make this work in your life. Not so you can make a lot of money, but so you can have peace in the area of financing. Wouldn't it be nice just to get a good night's sleep not worrying about money? Because... You've given to God, you've given more than you've given to God to your own savings account, and you've paid all your bills, and you're just enjoying the peace of God in your life because his kingdom is advancing, and you've leveraged your resources. We've all leveraged our resources for the kingdom of God. How many want to be a part of that? So we leverage our talent. We leverage our relationships, we leverage our time, we leverage our resources, and we wait for God to show up and do something amazing. So I know many of you have come to me and told me about places here and places there that might be a fit. And you know what? I've gone to every single one of those places and looked at them, every single one. Every time someone tells me there's a place, I go there and I look at it and I pray. And God's, God's talking. I'm telling you, there's a place. I'm not quite sure right now where it is, but I see it. I see it in my heart. I see it in my mind. I see it in my dreams. I see it, and people's lives are being changed. They're coming by the hundreds, by the thousands, because God has a place. And he wants this fellowship right here, all of you folks sitting right here, to be a part of it. Not to glorify any one person in this room, but to glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to always be pointing at Jesus. Always, always, always giving Jesus glory because he wants to show up in the supernatural and he's asking us, it's time. It's time for us to start walking in natural obedience in what we can do with what we have because God wants to honor it. He wants to multiply it. He wants it to be far greater. Five, six, seven, ten times worth what it's worth in our world. God's going to multiply it and make it even greater for him. Stand with me as we pray. Lord God, I challenge every single person in this room, including myself that we can embrace your principles. You're trying to bring us to a place where we understand your blessing. 
yes, we can try and find the loopholes. And yes, we can try and play the lottery. And yes, we can pray to God and send out Facebooks that say, if you, if you uh, click amen, then a blessing's coming to you. But those aren't your principles. You're a good, good father. And you want to bless us as we step into what you've instructed us to do for your house to be prosperous, for your people to be at peace, and for your kingdom to be advancing. So Lord, put on our heart to be leveraging our relationships, to be leveraging our time, to be leveraging our talent, and to be leveraging our treasure, because it all belongs to you. And we are just your stewards. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.